have face like that. They saw a beautiful baby, but they saw a mind inside of those eyes that they thought was irrational, illogical, pre-causal, amoral. That's the way philosophers and psychologists and even psychiatrists thought about babies for most of history. And it's really only been in the last 30 years or so as a result of a real scientific revolution in our understanding that we've realized that even the youngest babies both know more and learn more than we ever would have thought was possible before. And what I'm going to do today is talk about two new studies, brand new, fresh off the presses of our laboratory, um, that show just how much even very young babies and children know and learn, and actually show that in some ways, babies and children may actually be learning more and better than we do as grown-ups. Uh, so first of all, what we've discovered is that babies' minds are using the same kinds of calculations that the very best, most powerful computer learning systems use to learn. And a lot of those calculations are based on the ideas of this man, an 18th century statistician, Thomas Bayes. And what we've discovered is that babies are Bayesian. Babies are unconsciously using the same kind of calculations that on inside of those beautiful brown eyes, inside this is something like what it looks like. It's someone who's actually sitting there doing statistics, figuring out how the world works. Now, how can we ever show that babies understand statistics? After all, if any of you have ever taken a statistics course, you know that even grown-ups have a lot of difficulty understanding ideas like probability. Well, the way that we do it, and the way that we've really come to understand how much babies learn, is by asking them questions in their language instead of in our language. So instead of asking babies about statistics, what we do is design these simple little toys. This is the Blicket Detector and the Marble Dispenser. We show the children how the toys work, and then we try to see if the children in their actions show us that they've analyzed the statistics of these machines. So here's how the Blicket Detector and the Marble Dispenser work. Um, there's a little machine. You put a block on it, and it lights up and plays music. And sometimes that's all that happens. But sometimes what happens is you take the block, you put it on the machine, and amazingly enough, um, a, uh, um, a marble comes out of that nearby dispenser. So what babies are seeing is they're seeing a person put something on the dispenser, put something on the detector, and then either the dispenser gives them a marble or it doesn't give them a marble. Um, so that's a very simple way that we can actually show the babies a pattern of probability, a pattern of statistics. And in this experiment, we took 24-month-old babies. These are babies that aren't yet barely two. And what we did was we showed them someone first putting a red block on the machine and then a blue block on the machine. Now, both blocks actually make the machine go four times. The difference is that the red block makes the machine go four times, but it fails to make the machine go twice. And for the blue block, um, it works four times, and it doesn't work eight times. Now, if you can do the math, you can see that actually the red block is much more likely, has a higher probability of making the machine go than the blue block. But remember, these are 24-month-olds. They're just barely beginning to walk and talk. You might think, let alone sitting there and doing division and figuring out probabilities. Except that that's exactly what the babies seem to be doing. So these babies under the age of two chose the more prop the block that was more likely to actually make the machine go. So these babies had already done a little statistical analysis. Now, that's an easy problem. Here's a harder problem, and here's a problem for all of you to solve, too. Here's these three different blocks, D, E, and F, and they're going on the machine. When you put D on the machine by itself, nothing happens. When you put E on, nothing happens. When you put D and F together on the machine, it goes off, and that happens twice. And your job is to figure out which ones are blickets. Blickets make the machine go. Um, OK, let's ask in the audience, is D a blicket? OK, good. Is E a blicket? Is F a blicket? Is F a blicket? OK, so most of you are as smart as Berkeley undergraduates, maybe not quite as smart as four-year-olds, um, would say when you see this sequence of events that D made the block light up, but it was only because F, which was a blicket, made the block light up. 
Um, and that reflects the fact that you assume that individual objects have causal powers to make something go. But suppose I saw, showed you these events first. So now I show you that A, B, and C don't actually make the detector go, um, and A and B don't, and, uh, and B and C don't, but A and C together do. Now you might think, oh, no, maybe I was wrong about that sequence that I saw before. Maybe the way this machine works, the unusual way that this machine works, is that when you put a combination of blocks on, when you put two blocks on at once, it makes the machine go, even though the individual blocks don't make the machine go. So in other words, this is an unlikely, unusual hypothesis about how the machine works. Um, and what we did was we just did exactly what we just did with you um, with Berkeley undergraduates and four-year-olds. So we either gave them a hint that this was the normal, expected, likely, probable, obvious case, or that it was this very unlikely case, this case of actually um, uh, having the machine work in this unlikely, imp improbable, unusual sort of way. And then we gave them exactly the same test that we gave you. Um, but now, if you are considering that, uh, if you're thinking about it in terms of the sort of obvious way, then you'll say, well, probably D is not obligate. But if you're thinking, well, maybe it works in this weird, unusual way with the uh, two objects together making it go, then you might think, well, D and F are both blickets. And we did this experiment with adults, and when we did it with adults, with the undergraduates, what we discovered was that the children, the adults, um, only assumed that the individual blocks made it go. But we also did the experiment with four-year-olds. And here's a four-year-old in this experiment. Triangle on the machine. Are you ready? Let's see. Look at that. The machine did not turn on. Let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machine. Now, if you're that, having okay. some trouble tracking well, exactly what's going on here, you're that. in good company. David now Dobbs of the New York Times, science reporter, came to my lab and looked at this, and he said he was completely baffled. He couldn't figure out how the machine worked at all. Now let's see what happens when we put square on the machine, okay? Look at that. The machine did not turn on. Okay. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle and ball on the machine together. Look at that. The machine turned on. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle, square, and ball all on the machine together. Are you ready? Let's see. Look at that. The machine turned on. Okay, now let's see what happens when we put triangle and ball on the machine together. You ready? Let's see. Look, the machine turned on. So Scarlett, do you think that triangle is a blicket Now here's the crucial question. A blicket. And do you think that square is a blicket or not a blicket? No. No. And do you think that ball is a blicket or not a blicket? Okay, so Scarlett, which of these should we use to make my machine turn on? Okay, so that little four-year-old, Scarlett, figured out the right answer to the question. So she had figured out that actually both of the machines, both of the blocks, the D and the F block were blickets, and she actually used them to try to make the machine go on. And she wasn't just an exceptionally bright child. What we found was that four-year-olds consistently got that problem and solved that problem. They tested, they figured out that unlikely hypothesis, the one that didn't even occur to any of the brilliant people who were sitting here in this audience. Um, so consistently, the four-year-olds were actually figuring this task out. They were learning better than even our bright Berkeley undergraduates were. Now, why would this be? Well, if you look at the literature about machine learning that I mentioned before, you talk to people who are trying to design computers um, that can learn as much as possible about the world, they point to two different kinds of ways that a system can learn. And they talk about this as being the difference between exploitation and exploration, um, or a difference between low temperature search and high temperature search. Here's the basic idea. Imagine that you're trying to find a solution to a problem, or you're trying to find the answer to a question. 
One thing you can do is you can start from where you already are. You can take the thing that right now, with all your expertise and knowledge, you think is the most likely answer. And you might just try and change that answer a little bit, try something that's a little bit different from that answer. Um, now, that strategy is a very good strategy for getting to OK, reasonable solutions pretty quickly that you can implement and that are likely to work. But here's another strategy you could try. Another thing you could do is you could explore. You could say, you know, I think this isn't actually going to be a very likely answer, but what the hell, I'll just try it anyway. Or this solution seems completely crazy, completely out of the box, but let's live dangerously, let's just try it. And there's an intrinsic trade-off between these two strategies. So if you use the exploit strategy, you're more likely to get to an answer quickly, and it's more likely to be a pretty good answer, but you're likely to miss that really fabulous answer, that really creative, unexpected answer that's off in the corner. Um, like missing, for example, the fact that that blicket detector might work in this unusual way by putting two objects together. And what I think we've discovered is that if you think about babies and young children, babies and young children are really designed to learn. So the idea is, although babies and young children are much worse at that kind of exploit learning, they're much worse at taking what they know and putting it to use, they're actually much better than we are at exploring, at playing, at trying out completely crazy, mad ideas, at bouncing around the room and trying everything that they possibly can. And we think that this is actually an evolutionary reason why we have children at all. That's what children are designed for. They're designed to do this kind of broad exploratory, uh, this kind of broad exploration, and then we take all the things that they've discovered and put them to use to do our adult tasks. So the moral of this is, if you really want to have dangerous creativity, if you really want to think outside of the box, if you want to have new ideas, a good way to do it is to actually try to think like a baby.